Good morning. Let me get rid of this. Peter De Lorenzo is the ultimate, the uber car guy. He grew up in the metro Detroit area in what he calls the glory days of the U.S. auto industry, the 1950s and 1960s, where iconic cars debuted. The Corvette Stingray, the sporty little Thunderbird, the Riviera, and many others. In 1999, he brought his passion for cars, the insight of his 22 year career in automotive marketing and advertising and his insightful industry perspectives to the internet. His online publication, Auto Extremist, quickly became a must read for me when I was working in the auto industry and my colleagues. Peter is edgy. He's controversial. And he never minces words to skewer those companies or executives by name who, in his opinion, gut the soul of the U.S. auto industry. The engineering car guys, the true believers, as he calls them, have been supplanted by the MBA cost cutters, accountants, and committees who are responsible for the indistinguishably bland jelly bean cars on the road today. Here's a sample of, a, of his ire in a recent column. We cringe at the legions of spineless weasels who populate almost every corner of this business. The go-along to get-along hordes of dutiful, sniveling minions who project a positive demeanor but who wallow in serial abject mediocrity at every turn. Well, Peter, why don't you tell us how you really feel here? You know? Well, I should point out to you now that the auto extremist has a subtitle in his publication. It's called The Bare-Knuckled, Unvarnished, High-Octane Truth. And that just popped into my mind as I've been thinking about this gospel of today. Here we have these great crowds. They're following Jesus all over. His reputation had been spreading throughout the land of Israel. They came for healing. They came for deliverance. They came, some, for hunger. He fed our bellies. You came for the bread. And so imagine that this great crowd is moving along and Jesus stops and he turns around and he says, okay, guys, here it is. The bare-knuckled, unvarnished, high-octane truth. Unless you hate your father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not renounce all your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. How many of them turned? packed it in and went home. That was the problem, of course, with the rich young man who had asked Jesus, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and come follow me. And he left, sorrowful, because he had great possessions. And what about the time when Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. It says, Lord, that is a hard saying. And many of his disciples left. So let's get this straight here. We got to do these three things, right, Jesus? We've got to hate our a whole family, our own life. We got to pick up our cross and follow you every day. And we've got to renounce all of our possessions. That's it. You got it. But there are a few clarifications that we need to make here. To hate your family and self. We don't literally hate loved ones and our, even our own life. Hate 
here is an idiomatic expression that means to love less. And the point Jesus is making that you must, he himself, Jesus, must have absolute first place in our life exclusively above every other relationship and person. Haydock's biblical commentary states it this way, the law of Christ does not allow us to hate even our enemies. We must be willing to renounce and part with everything that would keep us from following Christ. Okay, two, carry your cross. A common Roman method of capital punishment for criminals and rebels, of course, was the cross, crucifixion. And St. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Here we have Christ, the innocent victim, who was free from sin, being crucified on an ignoble cross. But we, who deserve a death, our sinfulness, our rebellion from God, he says, you call, you come, carry your cross every day before me. Three, three renounce all your possessions. According to St. Bede, there is a difference between renouncing all things and leaving all things. He says, for it is the way of a perfect, a few perfect ones to leave all things. But it is the part of all the faithful to renounce all things. Well, what does that mean? The gospel fortunately gives us a clear picture of that. Peter and Andrew, James and John left their nets, their boat. They, left, they dropped their nets on the shore. They left the boat. They left their livelihood, their occupation. They left it all behind and followed Jesus. On the other hand, there were certain tax collectors and soldiers who were called to repentance. And Jesus said to the tax collectors, collect no more than is appointed you. And to the soldiers, he said, be content with your wages. They were not called to leave everything behind, but they were commanded to renounce cheating and greed. And by implication, they would remain in their occupation. Now, renouncing is fundamentally twofold. Renouncing sin, yes, we have to leave that. But renouncing our possessions, in what it means is that nothing would come before Christ in our life. Renouncing all, becoming detached from all. Those are the conditions. Those are the requirements or the gateway, we could say, to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. But what is the meaning of that relationship? What is the meaning, the end, the purpose of our discipleship? We need to go back to the roots in ancient Judaism, which discipleship is found to be the it's the principle of imitation. Deep in the heart of the Torah, the law of Moses, we read repeatedly in Leviticus, be holy, for I am holy. God says, be holy, for I am holy. Discipleship is imitating God, being like God, because God is holy. Therefore, we are to be like God, loving what God loves, doing what God does. And fortunately, we have a perfect example of that in Jesus Christ. St. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we have in the church the model of discipleship. So what does God love? What does God do? If we're going to do that, we need to know. If we go back to Genesis, we can see from the very beginning, the first thing God does, he creates. God created the heavens and the earth. And we are like God when we are creative. I think of innovative entrepreneurs that dream up great businesses. I think of great artists and musicians that have works of, of great beauty. We are creative people, and when we do that, we're like God. 
Because that's the way he made us, to be that way. God rests. He didn't go 24-7. He could have. But he took the seventh day off. And we should too. That's why we're here. We rest in God. God fashioned marriage, Adam and Eve. He invested himself in marriage and family. And that's what we should do as well. In Exodus, God feeds the hungry. The Israelites pilgrimaging through the, the wilderness rain down manna, and they're filled. We should feed the hungry. God buried Moses, too. God buried Moses. That's an interesting uh, reading if you go through there when he shows the land to him. And you're not going in, but I'll tell you what. You know. God buried Moses. So these works imitate or emulate, are emulated rather in the corporal works of mercy in many cases. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived from 1906 to 1945, merely 39 years, was a German Protestant theologian who was involved in a plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler, which led to his imprisonment and execution. He wrote a book, The Cost of Discipleship. I'd like to read a, a brief section from that. And if we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him, for only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ, who bids us to follow him, knows the journey's end. But we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Discipleship means joy. Will we answer the call to discipleship? Before we answer, though, we would be wise to pause and count the cost. The great, great cost of saying no. And that, my friends, is the bare-knuckled, unvarnished, high-octane truth. <laughs>